Hi, good morning. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, wherever in the world you are. I'm Ryan R. Fox, and I am our developer advocate here at Algorand, and I'm hosting our second uh, developer office hours. I'm thrilled that you're here to join us. Um, and we're going to um, take a look today at um, at Algorand Sandbox. All right. Uh, so what we're going to do here with our office hours is uh, break it up into uh, a quick welcome, and then I'll get into a demonstration of what Sandbox is, probably spend 10 or 15 minutes there, and then we're going to spend the bulk of the time today on your questions and answers. Um, developer focused, really um, anything. It doesn't have to be about the sandbox by any means. Whatever questions you have in, in your development efforts, uh, we're here to answer them uh, during this hour. So we'll go, we'll go for an hour. Again, it'll be about uh, 10 to 15 minutes here on sandbox and then most of the time on your questions. And I'm joined today by my colleagues, uh, Russ Fistino and Jason Weathersby, also here on the developer relations team. And they'll be answering those questions live for you as I go through the demo. Let's jump right in. What we're going to do today is we're gonna talk a little bit about, um, uh, about the sandbox. And really what that is, is a couple of prerequisites. You gotta have GitHub, you gotta have Docker, and then you can be running uh, Algorand on your local machine. And what this is, is a developer tool. So we're going to, um, we're going to show you something that's actually brand new. So um, coming out, actually it was merged in by, by Will on Friday, Sandbox 2.0, uh, really focused on the developers and spinning up the, the, the environment. Uh, and it has a few different components that we're going to talk about. This article is going to come out uh, on Wednesday in our developer newsletter, so make sure that you're signed up for that. You'll be able to uh, read through here and get a get a quick understanding about uh, how it works, but you guys get to see it here first. Um, we're going to, do, to understand that it's as easy as one, two, three. So all that you have to do on GitHub is clone the repo uh, within your Docker environment. Just run the command sandbox up, and then you start developing either with the uh, CLI tools that are included within um, the Docker sandbox image or connect to it with one of the SDKs. So let's jump right in and do that. All right. So I'm going to come over to uh, over to a terminal session here and I am going to uh, begin the, the the first step here, which is simply clone it, and then we're going to move into that directory. Downloads it, and then of course this. Is, so we've done we've done step one here. We've cloned it. The second thing is going to do is just uh, turn it up. So we will copy this command next, and this is going to take uh, on at least on my MacBook Pro. This is going to take about. Uh, a minute and 45 seconds to start up this. So while that's running, we're going to go over here and talk a little bit about what's going on. All right. So Sandbox has four components to it. It has the network node, it has a transaction builder, key manager, and a query tool. Now, if you've been working with the Algorand tool set before, then you probably know these as AlgoD, Goal, KMD, and Indexer. So new in the 2.0 is adding in indexer into the default builds, and then also the builds when when they start up are going to uh, default to start up a private network. Um, before, if you had used this tool, it it uh, defaulted to start the test net. Um, now it's going to default to start up the private net, and this is really nice because it will spin up all four of these components. It will give you some new accounts, and it will give you a couple of sample uh, transactions uh, that you can copy and paste and, and start using the CLI tools uh, straight away. So all of four of these uh, four components here uh, combine into this Docker image, and you simply run, uh, you, you simply access it by using the command sandbox. All right. The other way that I talked about that you can uh, access it is with your SDK, 
and there'll be a few ports that you'll want to want to uh, note down. So it'll always start algo D on port 4001, KMD on 4002, and indexer will be on 8980. So if you're using um, the SDKs um, from your from your host machine, uh, it, it will the, the the Docker image will uh, uh, map these ports for you and expose them to you so that you can connect localhost and then use these ports for those various um, uh, pieces there. All right, so hopefully by this time we have almost got this thing up and running. And while that finishes up here, I'm going to check with my colleagues, see if anybody's got any questions. Right, it's almost done. Trust me on that. Um, the demo gods are with me on this Monday morning to wrap up very, very quickly. I know they are. Um, here it comes. All right, so uh, again, by default, it's going to build the latest nightly version. So if we scroll up just a little bit, let's maximize this here. Um, uh, so for Elgo D, it builds the latest nightly, uh, nightly version. Uh, you can actually have some additional commands that um, tell it to build a specific commit or build uh, a, a different version. But the easy way that we did it uh, spins it up. It also builds up the latest version of Indexer. Uh, and then it begins that um, private, te the, the private test network here. So we see that we, that we actually are in sync. We are synced, um, but we're only on block two. And we notice here that the, the name of this network is uh, SANNET version one. All right. Um, indexer here, it also shows that the indexer is running and everything is fine. Now, what's nice that the, that it does here uh, on the private test network is that it gives you a few uh, uh, dummy accounts or test accounts uh, inside of your private test network. So we see that we've got these three accounts here. Uh, one of them is online producing the blocks, uh, running the consensus uh, locally, and then the other two are there for you. We see that we have uh, a couple of commands here that we can try. Uh, one of them is for indexer. So if I just copy and paste that in there and we run it, we don't get anything really back. We were, we were, we were querying the indexer for the set of transactions that it knows about. And in round 23, it doesn't know about any transactions. Well, that makes sense. It's brand new. Let's run this transaction. Uh, goal, and so the, the the way that you run this command is you uh, type sandbox, which is going to then uh, go into the uh, go into the Docker image and then execute goal, which is installed in there. So it's just like you would uh, write if if you had it installed locally. Goal clerk send the amount from this address to the other address. We hit enter, and we'll see that it will uh, send that transaction. Uh, confirm it, and then once we're done with that, we'll go and run that command again to query from indexer, and we see that we've got uh, that single transaction now uh, here. The other way that you could uh, do this is to use your um, uh, SDKs. So if you want to um, use an SDK, let's, let's try the Python SDK. So if you use Elgo S, SDK, right, Python, Elgo, uh, I'm sorry, Elgo Rand SDK, that's what we want. So if we install um, this Python SDK, we can, um, what I like to do is to is, is to head over to the uh, developer portal site, and um, you, I, I just like to use, I just like to search for uh, Hello World, and uh, well, or, or we got yeah, so so you can go for Hello World, and you can look for your first transaction. Um, inside of this section, um, it, it it talks about all of the different uh, languages that we have or SDKs available here. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do Python, and it gives the the important thing here is that it builds out uh, all the different steps for um, creating the client, 
signing and sending the transaction. Um, so I'm going to take a modified version of that and uh, create a new um, uh, a, a new um, file for us here. So if I go to uh, where are we at here? So if we go to uh, make this Python file here, and if I type in some code that I've already got from down here. All right. And, oh, you know what we forgot to do. Um, uh, okay, so we notice here that we've got, we're gonna, we're gonna create the um, client here uh, and, and we're, we're, we're sending it that uh, local host on uh, 4001, uh, the default token, and we're just going to instantiate that client. All right, um, and then down a little bit farther, it wants us to uh, put in a passphrase, and we need to get that passphrase first. So let's control X, yes. We forgot to get that passphrase. So we need to get, uh, so if we go to sandbox, um, uh, goal, account, uh, export, a, oh, we're gonna have to list it first, unless I can see it still. Yeah, let's grab this one. So we're copying one of those three accounts and we're gonna export uh, the mnemonic for it. So using the command uh, goal account export, um, it's going to go in, uh, start the KMD client, goal starts it, and then it's going to return us back this, um, uh, new mnemonic, and we're going to we're we're going to type that into our program here. Um, looks like I already had one in there, which is not valid because every time you start it, it's going to um, make a new one. So let's just type it in here, nice and easy. All right, save that up, and let's run it. Great. All right. So um, very, very quickly, um, what what it has done is it signed this transaction and it's sent it off. Um, we didn't do any wait wait fors. I had taken all of that out of there. But if we run back here to the curl command here, we should be able to see that we actually now have two transactions in there. So we've now sent a transaction uh, from the command line. We've also sent a transaction with the um, with the SDK, so that is uh, that is really what uh, Sandbox is in a nutshell in very very quick times. Um, I want you guys to know about this. I'll post this deck so that you guys have this. Um, what we what we looked at here today was Sandbox. We we cloned it from from the GitHub rep repository. There's this article that's going to come out on the um, on on our site on, on the developer um, um, on the developer portal site on Wednesday. So look for that in your uh, developer newsletter. If you haven't signed up for the developer newsletter, make sure that you do that here. And then of course, make sure that you are connected with us on Discord as well. And Good question, Ryan, yes. for you. Can, yes. uh, I, you know, the creating of the new accounts is a fairly new feature for Sandbox. Are they are they the same accounts that are created every time you bring up an instance of the Sandbox? Uh, no, so they're they're not. Every time that you that, that, that you run, uh, so so if, if, if I, I don't know if I want to take it down, but if, but if I go Sandbox down and then go Sandbox up again, New, we will get a, a, a new set of accounts uh, here when when we do this. So, so if I go sandbox goal list accounts, these sandbox goal uh, accounts. So this this set of uh, uh, accounts that are here will be different every time. That's actually why in my code. Uh, okay. I, for that passphrase, I had to comment it out, and I had to change it because the last time I ran it, um, it was it was something else. So every time that'll be different. However, if you want to also use Sandbox to connect to other networks, you can. So probably just show this here. 
Um, let's just do this one more time so that it's a little bit easier. So uh, the sandbox commands are um, up and it, it, it allows you to set any environment and, and it, you can tell it to start uh, testnet, mainnet, devnet, uh, or if you leave it blank, it will start this, this private network. Um, so that's so that's really nice uh, on on my MacBook Pro. If I say uh, sandbox up testnet, it will uh, run the fast catch up uh, immediately, and it takes about eight and a half minutes in order for it to clone it, download it, uh, download the fast catch up blocks, and then actually bring in the, the the other blocks that it needs. In about eight and a half minutes, you can have testnet. Mainnet's uh, approximately the, the, the same amount of time, um, so that's really helpful. This this is designed for developers. It is not meant to be an infrastructure tool that you would you know be running production environments on in terms of uh, node management and so on. But it's 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 definitely designed for you guys as developers to get up and have this infrastructure uh, running quickly so that you can connect it with uh... your I was, was going to say one alternative to uh, the it, it, seeing how they don't create the standard accounts. It might, uh, uh, like Robert commented, it might be an issue with uh, testing, trying to do repeat of testing. Uh, you could do start it up as a testnet account too, correct? And then create your accounts. And then you've always got those because uh, those are external to the image. And it's not, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, and, and for that, that, then you would simply, then you would just do, uh, then you would do a sandbox goal uh, import, and then you would import import your mnemonic here, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that would allow you then to have to to take that mnemonic and put it into KMD inside of the uh, inside of the sandbox, and then yes, now now you can do all of your development against testnet. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions before I turn it over to uh, our live Q and A? There was one here. It says, "What's the difference between DevNet and private net?" Sure. Okay. So the question about what is what is DevNet? So so um, Algorand maintains three different networks. Mainnet, obviously, that's that's where all the live the the real algos are. That's where the value is. Testnet. That is um, essentially the same code base as what mainnet is, uh, but that's where we're we're testing uh, everything. We want developers to start building their applications there. Uh, they still use algos, but they're not. They don't have any value. Um, and then uh, DevNet is more used internally, uh, and it has uh, uh, well, there, well, there's oh, there's there's BetaNet as well, which is another public one, which is which is brand new. Uh, code base will be on there, and then DevNet is also this one that goes up and down all the time. We don't really recommend that 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 people use DevNet. Now, private net is is one that that will run locally to you. The accounts that you create are really just for you um, because nobody else is connecting to it. So, so that it doesn't it doesn't have any uh, DNS records published, so nobody else knows how to connect to your private network. Um, this is where you want to start developing. It's quick to, you know, spin it up and tear them down. One uh, thing to be aware of, Ryan, is uh, I don't think we can see the account information in the block explorers, correct? With the private net, that's my understanding. That's only correct. If you were, yeah, that's yeah, correct. yeah, okay. Only if you were able to start it up as testnet, then you can look at it there. But uh, the downside there is you would not have access to the indexer. So the indexer feature is to the uh, special to the private network, which is which is great because now we finally got a uh, an indexer that uh, developers can use to test with if you're doing queries. Yeah, Correct. when he says right. and, when, and when Ryan you said testnet, when you said devnet earlier, as far as the when you start the sandbox up, box up, you're basically getting the latest and greatest binaries, right? So, but you yep. are technically not accessing devnet; you're accessing a private network. Yes, correct. Just so we the same binaries. Yep. Yes, exactly. The same the same binaries that are in uh, master. 
so we are so we are pulling um, nightly. So I, well, I actually, actually, I take that back. Uh, by default, it, it, it's pulling it out of release nightly. Um, so you can see that we're on 2.2, uh, 6.95, which is a, a handful of commits ahead what master is or what the what, what the release for 2.2 is. Um, but yes, the, the the genesis ID that it that it spins up is uh, Sandnet. Um, yes, and, and okay. So another point, you know, in, indexer uh, by default it it turns on within your um, within your private network, and then that is kind of your explorer. But yes, uh, if if you want to use uh, the on, on testnet or mainnet, uh, there are third party providers that have um, beautiful uh, uh, explorer tools for you guys to see those transactions publicly. All right, let's. Let's let's turn it. Uh, let let let's bring uh, Russ and Jason uh, on camera. We're gonna we're gonna go to uh, live uh, Q and A uh, stuff here. Um, ask me anything. Almost. Um, we we really want this to be focused on you, the developers. One in the there's one in the question Q and A box it says in Ethereum when when you uh, run a private net you can define several parameters of the network type of consensus difficulty gas etc is it possible in sandbox to do the same here uh, they we use a pro, i don't i don't know if uh, the sandbox gives you the private network configuration file uh, but you can uh, here I'm I'll give you a link to a tutorial that I'm going to post it in the uh, in the chat to everyone and this that is a tutorial for creating a private network if you wanted to but that one requires that you run you have the binaries downloaded and installed so the question would be do you run do, do are you allowed to modify the network template that it's being used because yes you can set a bunch of the properties in there i don't think you can set uh the type of consensus it's still going to use the same but you can obviously uh, uh spread the um stake around how you like and the stake determines how the yeah. votes are anyways uh, within Sandbox, you can uh, you can configure a number of, of different pieces, but um, and, and 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 they're in this article here as well. But you know, talking about which which branch, which network you want to talk to, but I don't think that you can go in and change the consensus uh, itself. Yeah. No, no, no. Nope. Uh, and I'm going to also paste in the chat the network properties that you can look at. That uh, we have most of them documented at that link right there. Or properties in them uh, uh, for a particular node that you can change. And uh, uh, Chris is obviously on the call. Chris is pointing out that if you use Reach, it uses a private network as well. I'll ask the first question to get get the ball rolling. Um, is yeah. there any any uh, like are, are any apps coming out soon that have the browser inter interaction with uh, Algo Signer that's going to be on the portal? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. Um, uh, I don't, I don't think we have any uh, set up uh, in the hopper right, right now that are using AlgoSigner. But anything that we build going forward, as an example, will pop, most likely include that capability. If you go look at uh, uh, AlgoDesk.io, which is a uh, Shiva built, which is an absolute fantastic example of uh, building a web-based uh, IDE type uh, uh, solution for Algorand. He uses Algo Signer for that. That's all uh, integrated into his uh, example as well. So it's available out there. You can go look at. <clears throat> and I think they are uh, they've added the capability of doing application calls to Algo Signer. I'm not 100% certain it's fi in, in final yet, but it, it, that was the latest I'd heard is that that was going into the uh, Algo Signer. Somebody asked the question, is it possible to communicate between two private networks? What you can do is with a private network, while we say this in the template, right now, if you if you look at one of those uh, documents, I said in the reference documentation under node reference, there's a setting in there that will tell you how to add more than one node to an existing private network. Uh, now, if you when you say can two of them communicate, that I'm assuming you mean two nodes in a private network. And the answer to that is, yes, you can do that. Um, and and any as long as you have the uh, the connection ports and the um, tokens, anyone can connect to your private network and consume it. So there, that is definitely possible. 
Another good use for um, a private net too is when uh, beta net is in a state of flux. In other words, rapid changes all the time. And uh, by creating the private network, which is the default now, it will be the default for a sandbox, uh, will give you a consistent environment, you know, at least until you, you reclean it or, or, re, or redo it. Uh, so that will main, uh, maintain the same uh, protocol code base. Uh, so that's one time I, I feel um, uh, is, a, is a really good uh, use case for uh, using um, the uh, private network is, is for whenever you're working with Betanet. Gives you a nice stable test base. Someone's asking, will we be doing a uh, training? Will there be a training video for Podtail uh, uh, that'll be published? Right now, we have some. We have some. You know, we have the do developer documentation up there. We haven't done a video on just Podtail itself, and I think that that's something we'll probably uh, uh, start off with by doing a presentation in, in one of the developer uh, office hours, and then we'll probably record that and put that online. Yeah, we've got quite a lot of resources about Podtail. Uh, in in the website as well. If you go to the uh, Staple Smart Contracts page and you read the overview in it, you'll notice we'll, we'll have Teal in there. There's a tab view that you can also look at the Pi Teal uh, associated with any of our examples. And we're slowly converting everyone. Anywhere you see Teal, we're trying to convert that to also have a Pi Teal example right next to it as well. There you are. So uh, Gina Paolo indicated he's actually using Raspberry Pi to develop uh, some things. Um, yeah, sure uh, Cosmo, Cosmo put out that uh, AlgoNim is a great example for uh, uh, using uh, that has a good source of Pytel in it. And that's Cosmo's example, and it is fantastic as well. Great one to look at. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Cosmo, why don't you post? Uh, 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 put the either Slack me the link so I can post it on the on the channel, or uh, post it in the Q and A. All right. So here's a question from uh, Stefano uh, Ryan. I'm still confused about the difference between private net, dev net, and test net. Which one should I pick if I want to start developing? Mm -hmm. I I think I always like to start with the private network. It's it's the quickest. It uh, again, it has Indexer available so that you get all of the tools uh, in, in in our toolbox up quickly. Um, it it prefunds the account so you don't have to worry about going to the public faucet and and doing that. Um, but it, I guess, the only downside is that it that it does not have a pretty um, uh, explorer block explorer. So you right. so you are using um, you're using Indexer to do all of those queries. So there's a bit of a learning curve for that, and it is uh, CLI as opposed to a pretty web web interface. Do Jason, Russ, do either of you have a comment yeah, on, I, on that? I think I think my, what might be confusing is this whole DevNet thing. Dev, DevNet is basically just a, is we, we have three main networks, BetaNet, TestNet, and MainNet. Those are the three main ones. DevNet is an internal one that the engineering team uses, and it, they take it down, restart it, do all that. So typically, that's it's like engineering's private network, right? So when, mm -hmm. when Ryan said DevNet earlier, what he meant was the latest binaries, and you're creating your own private network. That's what that's what uh, that's what Sandbox out of the box does. You can change that to point at the like TestNet, for example, if you want to. And if you've used our sandbox already, you know that that used to be the default behavior. Now it's now it's creating its own network. And in addition, sandbox didn't used to have indexer, which indexer is going to be used to query just about anything. Like if you, uh, you know, we have this note field, right, that you can attach to every transaction. One of the things that people use that for is, oh, I want to search that note field later. So I want to put a little moniker in there that I'm always going to search for. Well, that's really difficult to test because you need the indexer up plus you need a note up. And that becomes, uh, it, it's a lot more, um, it's a little bit time consuming to install the indexer, but most importantly, it takes time for it to sync against testing, which could take days. And so uh, having a, having a uh, uh, the sandbox do all that for you is what makes that, in my opinion, so valuable. And, I'll, and, and the, for example, on the, the 
I did a, 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 a small digital exchange uh, example that's out there. It, I'm using, I'm, someone opens an order, a limit order, says oh, I want someone else to fulfill this order. I'm using the uh, indexer to search for those open orders. So all I'm doing is give me every, search the entire blockchain and give me any open orders. And that's what I'm displaying on a, on, on a list box, for example. So that's when you would want to be able to uh, do those kind of things. Is it's nice to have it all in one container, and you can just point your whole development environment at that. Wanted to note um, a few minutes ago, I cleaned up the sandbox environment, and then I, I executed the sandbox up testnet. I don't know if you noticed that, but. Here's where it's at right now. Maybe it's a little small, but it says that it's uh, starting the sandbox for uh, testnet. It uses the same binaries. Um, you notice that because it's going to run one of the public networks that already has blocks in it, it's going to disable indexer. But what it is going to do instead is it's going to run fast catch up which is really nice. So you'll notice that it started algo D and it says, okay, the last committed block was uh, 196 here, right? Cause it only had run for um, 10 seconds. So it had downloaded the, the first 200 blocks or so. And then it started um, the fast catch up. And so it's actually looking for uh, block 1.08 million or I guess 10.8 10 million that is. Um, and now it's just completed downloading all of those. So now you see that the last committed block is that one. And then now what it's doing is it is syncing all of the uh, other blocks from the peer network to catch up to the head. And this will probably take another two or three minutes. So if I do sandbox status now, what we'll see is that we've downloaded you know, 500 blocks in 27 seconds, and we are trying to get to the head. I don't know where the head is uh, currently, but the, the important thing to note is that this is now uh, connecting to testnet. It did not create us any um, uh, test accounts on here, right? Sandbox, goal. So no wallets are there. So so you know, when when you when you turn it up for any of the public networks, um, you will have to go through and either import your accounts or generate new ones. And you can do that with uh, with with the goal commands uh, just as you uh, normally would. All right, let's. Um, I, I don't again. I don't want to spend too much time on on sandbox here. Um, I, I would really love to hear some of your other questions uh, on, on development. Uh, yeah, Sheep is asking, is it is the best way to uh, save a J JSON object in a stateful smart contract? Is it stored on IPFS and save the URL in our smart contract, like an array of to-do items or something like that? And my answer to that would be, it, it depends on how big the JSON object is. Uh, if you're storing it in state, that means you have, uh, you you have key you're you storing in key value pairs and those key value pairs can only be the key can be 64 bytes long and the value can be 64 bytes long. Chances are your JSON object's probably bigger than that. So using something like IPFS and then dropping the pointer to that IPS IPFS file in state's probably your best option. There there was a there was a recent article about about that uh, using IPFS uh, with Algorand, and there was an example here of uh, of doing that, connecting um, IPFS and using using the JSON. I'm sorry, using the JavaScript uh, SDK to create some transactions and store a blob onto uh, IPFS. So again, if you wanna, if you just wanna go to the developer portal and type in IPFS, that article will will come up for you. I had a question here on uh, how many gigabytes you need to sync with Testnet, and it's um, 
from my experience, the last time I did it, it was about a month ago. That was about 130 gig, but that was for full index and full archived. The default is just for the last 300 blocks, so it's actually pretty tiny um, in terms of the space requirements. So hope yeah. that answers that question. Yeah, because you can run it as an archive or non-archive. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we so we got it in sync now. So that took maybe a Maybe it took uh, nine or ten minutes since I started that. Um, there, you know, th th this is this is extremely small. I guess so, some of the uh, some of it gets stored in the in the Docker uh, folders as well. So I'm not exactly sure how how big this is, but um, it's very lightweight if you're if you're running the sandbox version. Stefano, what do you want for, it says, could you share the IPFS link or did you guys do that already? Oh, no, there is, uh, there is no, there, oh, you were talking about the, for the example? Yeah, we'll get that, hang on a second. Okay. I think I got it here, chat. And that's just an example. You, you, you can use any. So we got a couple of questions here from Gina Palolo. Uh, so I'm actually using a Raspberry Pi to develop some things. Does Private network, you know, uh, I think the question is, does private network actually support uh, something like that? And then uh, he does not see any real opportunity to use the sandboxes or any. Well, it's basically the quickest way to get set up, right, Brian, for development work. Yeah, but you're not going to, I don't think sandbox would be supported running it on top of a uh, Raspberry Pi, but I haven't tried it, so I don't know. I don't, okay. I don't, I, he, he's technically correct in this, it's probably not something that's going to be of value if you're, if you're, if you're doing all your development work on a Raspberry Pi, I don't, I don't think it's, we don't, we don't test against Raspberry Pi. It's not in our, uh, we do have people that uh, build it on, built Algorand nodes on it, but we don't, that's not in our test matrix, I don't believe. So I don't think, I don't think we tested uh, um, the same box on it, is what I'm saying. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I would be surprised that it didn't work. I, I should I should try that out. Maybe I'll do that next weekend. Um, but since since Docker is supported on Raspberry Pi, um, I I would suspect it would work. I'll try it out next weekend. Yeah, and, and just so you know, that all these sessions, uh, Shamir is recording, and I believe that we're putting those on our uh, Algorand's YouTube channel. Right, I just pasted the link for the previous one we did last week on smart contracts. Um, so if you want to take a look at that, make sure to, to do that. All right. Yeah. Chris is on for the 15th, um, reaches on the 15th. We're going to, I think we're going to go, uh, we're going to do, uh, the, the 10th, the week of the 10th, we'll probably be doing it on, um, assets, not certain on that yet. So we'll put out, we'll send out a update as soon as we uh, make a decision on which topic. Be, it would really be nice as if you would, uh, um, uh, uh, send us your uh, what you would like to say you can do that through uh, joining our discord channel and just ask us on tell us what you'd like to learn about on discord uh or um you can throw it in a q a here today if you'd like if there's something specific you would like us to do one on stefano you um you had asked the question you're approaching a new project where you need to represent cyber threat intelligence information under the stick standard that's you're saying it's big json files Yes, it depends on what you want to do with those. But if you if they if it's big JSON files and, and if they're if they're more than a K, one kilobyte, you, uh, then you're gonna have, you're better off just storing off chain and then having the reference pointer from that in either a transaction note or in, if you're using stateful smart contracts, you can store it in the key value pair things like that. So it depends on what you're trying to do and if you want to. If you want to give us some more details, either now or uh, on Discord, just ping us on the scope on Discord, and we, we can help you with uh, help you with your design if you want us to. Here's a link uh, to there's a debugging video that uh, that I put together a few weeks ago as well. So I dropped that into the chat if you guys want to take a look at that on our uh, YouTube channel. All right, so I had. Uh, Turned sandbox down, and I, I I turned it back up to come in the um, in the private test network once again, and it is just about done here. It's brought up Indexer, and as we see here, it created new accounts. I don't I don't 
know if anybody remembered, but <laughs> it definitely um, did some different ones. A new one came in. Uh, is it possible to enable remote debugging on multiple ports, something like debug multiple contracts parallelly? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Any idea on that, Jason? Uh, I don't think that's currently possible. I mean, you're right. I'd have to uh, have to check with um, the, the engineer to develop the tool, but I don't think that's possible. You can do remote debugging of the contract. That you can do, but I don't think doing multiples. Now, one thing is when you're doing debugging, if you have like an atomic transaction, you can set the index number and debug a specific uh, transaction in that group. You can, you can do that. So it's actually mm -hmm. multiple transactions happening at the same time, but not, and, and that can be multiple contracts. So say I may, I, a lot of times I will group uh, uh, an atomic, atomically group a stateful contract and a stateless contract, and I want to debug one or the other. So you just set the index on the one that you're looking to debug. All right. Well, once again, uh, we've got office hours, uh, basically, uh, every week here for the rest of the year and we'll continue to do this uh, into the new year as well uh, so we invite you to come back um, next week on the 10th of december we'll be starting uh, a few hours later and uh, we'll get the topic figured out again uh, connect with us on discord or in the forums um, and let us know what topic you'd like us to cover uh, we spend about 15 minutes going over a quick demo of that topic, and then we'll take your live questions and answers on your development needs. So thanks, everybody, for joining this week. To uh, Russ and Jason as well for uh, joining and helping with the questions. I appreciate that. We'll see you again on the 10th. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.